Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we're talking about exporting and it's the circle of wholesale in the US market looking specifically at logistics, landed prices and tariffs. And I know this has been one that there's been a lot of demand from people for this particular topic. So today we will have um, myself and two speakers um, just to talk you through the details. John McDermott from Emerald Freight will be joining us very shortly. He's just been delayed. So if you see somebody pop on your screen midway through pre the presentation, don't get <laughs> right, it's John joining us. Um, and I have Marcus Williams here with me. Marcus is from the Atlantic Link. And Marcus has done, I think, two of the other it's two webinars so far, Marcus, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So many, many of you will be aware. Marcus has been working in the US market for many years. Ah, here's John. Hi, John. <laughs> so Marcus has been working in the US market for many years and has been exporting on behalf of a variety of craft and non-craft businesses over the years and has a wealth of experience in this area. So Marcus is going to start off the presentation giving us the wider parameters. And then we'll get into the details of particularly duty, freight and that sort of thing. And that's where John will come in. So welcome, John. John is from Emerald Freight. And again, I think we were talking earlier, John, 39 years, I think they're in business here in Ireland, helping small, medium and large sized businesses get products all over the world. But in particular, they're great at getting things into the US. So I'm just here today to moderate, handle any questions. This is one where you may be inclined to have quite specific questions. So make sure you just throw any questions that you have into the chat down the bottom of the, you'll see it on the bottom of your screen there. Any questions you have, we'll come to them at the end. And anything that we don't get to, we will send an email out afterwards if there's anything that we didn't get to answer. So with that, I'll go on to Marcus and let you carry on. Thanks, Marcus. Great, Nicola. Thank you very much. Afternoon, all. Um, hope you're keeping well. Uh, I'm just going to, as, as Nicola said, I'm just going to give you a kind of overview um, uh, of exporting to the States. But obviously, our, our speciality today um, and the detail is in the logistics, the landed price and the tariffs. Um, previously, I spoke about researching buyers and um, how to find them and then actually how to pioneer the market. But this is, uh, this is definitely one of the very important parts of that because uh, you've done all that work, uh, you've got to get it to the customer then, and there's quite a bit involved. Um, uh, certainly not daunting, but you need to know uh, the detail of it um, in order to make a smooth journey from your maker's uh, location to the, to the US customer. So with that in mind, um, uh, I suppose just to give you the, the export decision, um, your decision is to sell into a particular country based on all the research that you may have done, um, specifically, you know, with, with a background to your own business um, and to come up with a very clear strategy. Um, uh, in years gone by, you sort of, people think, oh, I'm going to go and do the US market and, and, and they decide that one month and then, you know, they might get a good lead here or there, but you, you, you have to have a plan in place and, and really actually it's a three-year plan. Uh, uh, it has to be practical, it has to be achievable and of course you have to have the resources which uh, in my world essentially means you've got to make sure you've got the money to do it. Um, uh, it's, that's a vital cog. Um, that plan of course can re be reviewed constantly like any business plan um, and as you begin to absorb more data about that specific market, you can you, that that plan will evolve. Um, uh, so, with that in mind, um, I think I just wanted to give you an idea of the channel of a consumer sale. So, you know, wherever you are in Ireland and you're making your piece of ceramic or textile or candle or uh, moisturizer, whatever it might be, um, you have got to have a clear path. Um, from the production of that piece to a consumer purchasing that product, um, either in a brick and mortar store or either online. And, and I suppose, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the vital cogs is to ensure that you're informed about the logistics and the duties and the shipping. Um, uh, so as, as you may have heard me a few weeks ago talking about the wholesale customer list, 
So where you start with your list, and a number of you obviously would be very uh, experienced or would have gone to Showcase Ireland, um, uh, you know, which is a, a very good starting point where you can pick up ethnic Irish stores, um, which a lot of you would know about. Um, there are some mainstream independents at that show as well, and there are some mainstream multiples, um, as well as the Museum Store Association. When, 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 you, when, you, when you start to activate the travel um, of heading towards the US market, um, all of these various uh, channels of selling have their own shows. Um, uh, mainstream multiples would be the likes of Bloomingdale's and Nordstrom and Dillard's and, uh, uh, you know, Whole Foods. Um, these are giants. Uh, Dillard's has 300 locations. Um, Bloomingdale's has 62. I think Nordstrom has about 80. Um, they, 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 they're, they're extremely difficult to, to get into, but the rewards are outstanding. Um, and, and just to give you a snapshot, you know, you don't ring them up and they, they put you on the shelf a couple of months later. These guys take six months to a year to 18 months to get into because you're falling into the slipstream of their buying practices. Um, mainstream independence is a little bit more, uh, a little easier, like it is at home, like it is in Ireland. You know, you could call on a store and they, they might put you in practice and on their shelves for, for the upcoming season. So it's a lot more reactive. Um, the ethnic Irish market, as you all know, there's some really, really strong ethnic Irish stores um, throughout the US. Um, uh, a lot of them have been there for years. They've got extremely good experience. Um, and they, uh, they, in themselves, they would be, have great answers and are a great help when you're shipping to the US because they've obviously been doing it directly from Ireland via the likes um, uh, of Emerald Freight with John. Um, so, and then just as, Another entry point is the Museum Stores Association, and I mention that because I know that the Design Council have worked very closely with them and have a very strong relationship with, with a number of the stores there. So again, it's like the ethnic Irish market. It's quite easy to tap into because all the selling channels are in place. Um, so anyway, you've built up your customer market uh, uh, or the research on it that I mentioned before. Um, based on this research and strategy, you need, without question, your US dollar price list. Um, uh, it, it, it's really important. Um, and part of that is to have worked out your freight and your logistics. Um, uh, what I was actually going to do with you um, as part of this is, is to share a spreadsheet with you. Um, and excuse me while I just pull it up here. Uh, can you all see that, Nicola? Can you see that? Yeah. So basically what, what I did is, is I find it much easier to show people this on a spreadsheet rather than talking numbers and they're going, what's he on about? So uh, uh, it's, it's, what I did is I just took a, a very simple format. So let's take a ceramic plate and, you know, your euro wholesale price list, let's say, for example, that's 10 euro. In order to work out your US landed price, there's various things you've got to factor in. One of them is duty. And, and John is, is the expert on that uh, and can direct us later in the talk as to where you find out your duty rates. Um, ceramics is around 6%, so obviously that makes it 60 cents. And again, there are variables on that. Um, after that, you've worked out what your duty is, you're shipping. Um, always put the duty, by the way, in the first column after the wholesale because you don't want to pay duty on the shipping and the exchange rate. Uh, put, the, put the duty in the first column after your wholesale. So you've got your duty in, you've got your shipping. I factored in 10%. That's a big variable. Um, uh, if you've got light, small product, it's going to be a lot less. If you're, if you're doing a larger volume, it can be a lot less. Um, and again, uh, uh, that's John's area of expertise. But I just took an average that, for example, you put 10%. So you've got your 60 cent for your duty on your 10 euro. You've got your one euro on your 10 for shipping. That totals 11.60. You then factor in the exchange rate. Now the exchange rate today is 1.12. So I put in 1.15 up here in the formula. You can put a bigger buffer in if you want, but just be careful because it shoves your, your, your wholesale price up. So that makes it $13.34.
not particularly professional to have it in at a, at, at a unit price. So um, I've rounded it up to 1350. So just, you know, again, same formulas on a seven euro piece. Um, and again, I can share this sheet with anybody if you want the formulas for it. Um, and you can put in your own wholesale over here in column C. Um, this gives you your US landed price to the customer. Now, there's a couple of variables there. Obviously, if what a customer orders one ceramic plate, uh, it ain't going to work out that well. <laughs> so um, you need to have some minimums in there. I find that a thousand dollar minimum order, uh, it, you can give the customer free shipping. But again, I'll let John come back to some of that. Um, uh, what I do with some of my um, makers is everything over a thousand is 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 free shipping, and again, that's a variable. Under a thousand, they pay a thirty-five dollar ship charge. Now, a lot of a, a lot of American retailers are absolutely fine with that because they usually pay the shipping from the city within the states to their store, just like you would in Ireland. You know, if you've got somebody making something in Kerry and you're shipping it to Galway, it's, it, they, the, the retailer pays that shipping charge unless you give them a special. So just, this gives you an idea of, of, of where you're at. And, and I'll refer back to this in a little bit because obviously this factors into your Euro retail price list and your US retail price list. And they have got to correlate, they've got to reconcile to a large degree because the old internet has given the game away on that front. So uh, uh, very important that you have that because a lot of customers uh, searching your product in the US can find out how much it is retail in Euro. So they've all got to be, uh, they've all got to be talking to each other. Um, so just referring back then to uh, the presentation, um, US dollar price list as discuss discussed. Um, in addition to that, you need to have clear and relevant terms. Uh, you know, title of goods are yours until they're paid for. Payment terms, credit card all the way, guys. Uh, uh, unless you're dealing with the biggies, uh, the likes of Bloomingdale's and some of the multiples who won't give you a credit card, obviously. Uh, it'd be like trying to get a credit card off Brian Thomas, good luck with that. Um, and uh, um, just, you know, but I, I would really try credit card the majority of the way unless you've got a very strong relationship with that retailer. Um, uh, and even then, uh, there can be pitfalls. Um, US retailers love a bit of uh, uh, Visa or MasterCard or Amex. There are charges with that. A lot of them will do PayPal. Um, obviously, the best way to do it is by wire transfer because then there aren't so many fees involved, particularly for larger orders. Um, damages and shortages notification, they've got to tell you within 10 days. Um, a, a new customer account has obviously got to send in address, details. If they've got multiple locations, you need to know where they all are so that you know exactly where each store is. Um, again, if you want, I've got a very good uh, cheat sheet on all of that um, uh, that, that I can send you. It's at the back of all the brochures that, that I represent. Uh, so I can definitely help you there. Um, I suppose pricing is key. Um, uh, as mentioned, you must consider all the additional costs of export while, while, while you're considering this. Um, it's very important to have the prices, as mentioned, at home, um, uh, it, it, reconciling with your online pricing. Uh, do the maths based on the facts that I showed you. Um, if there is any discrepancy between your export price and your RRP at home, they're going to catch you out super quick. I get continuous emails if, there's, if there isn't any reconciliation. So let's go back to the 10 euro wholesale. That's $13.50. That 10 euro wholesale is gonna be about, I don't know, 24 euro retail, 22, depending on the, on the markup you're giving the retailer. You can get away with kind of 28.50, 29.50 US. If they see any further discrepancy, you're in trouble. Uh, uh, and they start asking a lot of questions. So very important to have that continuous um, uh, story. Uh, and as a result, don't create channel conflict, be consistent. Uh, and again, I can help you uh, 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 directly with that where, where needed. Um, there's obviously various options. Duty paid and delivered is, is the one that I've gone through. And, and 
I find that gives the buyer great comfort. Of course, you can do delivery where the buyer pays the duty and you pay the freight and currency. And again, John is very good at that. Um, the other option is X workshop. So you literally have your, your pallet or your cartons at the back door of your, your um, production facility and they do all that. A lot of the Irish stores, for example, might do that because they would go to showcase, um, they do all their buying in the spring and then they would have deliveries um, uh, via the likes of Emerald Freight and they would consolidate it because then they're in control of the exchange rate, the shipping and the duty. Um, uh, there aren't a huge amount of American independent retailers who will do that. In fact, I, I don't know of any. Um, I know one multiple I deal with in Connecticut, they do it because they buy a lot of European products. So they want to be in control of the duty and the shipping and the exchange rate. Uh, so why the landed price? I suppose that comes back to it's essential to offer pricing in the local currency shows the buyers that you're serious about their market. Um, it's professional, it's credible. It means that you're, 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 you're mirroring what they are dealing with from domestic suppliers. Um, it gives them reassurance, um, uh, particularly if they don't usually buy from abroad. Um, know your currency. And as you saw, I put in a little bit of a buffer there. Um, uh, if there's a big currency fluctuation, don't worry about it. You can put at the bottom of the price list or in your brochure, if there's a big swing in the currency, you just redo your price list and most of them know about it. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, th th don't be scared to, years ago, uh, again, you know, when it was all paper, people would put in quite a big buffer because they only wanted to change their prices once a year. Now you can change the price if you want uh, because it's so much easier to communicate with all the buyers. And, and to be honest, it's been very stable for the last year, but I am not a currency trader, so don't take my word for it. Uh, so, um, uh, obviously you can talk to your bank about various supports in this way. Um, on that note, uh, uh, this is when it starts getting complicated. So I'm going to hand over to John. <laughs> this is when US customs and people get involved. So, um, uh, look forward to your questions later and John, um, I'll hand over to you. Now, John, we have you on mute there. So if you just want to press the mute button, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. That was very interesting and very enlightening and uh, you're spot on there. Um, yes, uh, I'll just start here with you. US Customs are strict. Every one of them are strict and it's going to just get worse in the uh, times that we're living in. I think we're probably going to see a lot more, um, you know, demands from customs in relation to documentation and everything else. But um, the, the website there that I've um, we put up, um, if you want to get your um, there's a little search uh, logo in that you can just log into it, and uh, you just put the description of your item, and uh, basically it will tell you the HS code and the duty rate. Um, I'd refer to the HS code, and um, it's very very important you put this on your invoice um, alongside the description of the goods. The reason being, um, a lot of the brokers, I sometimes wonder what they do in the three and a half years that they uh, serve over there uh, studying for their license, because half the time they, they haven't a clue what they're doing, I, that's my own opinion. So it's very important that you show the HS code, the harmonized code that you, that's on that site, say it's a uh, woolen sweater, we'll use that. You put a good description in, you uh, show ladies or gents or children's, you show um, the fabric it's made from, the fiber it's made from, be it that it's um, cotton or wool. Um, as much information as you can get on there, uh, it's very, very important. That helps the customs uh, to quantify and to agree with the harmonized code. So, as I say, if, you have, if you're exporting sweaters, you show all that information and you show the harmonized code. This will ensure that the customs broker will use the correct code. And instead of, um, you know, I, I've seen cases where uh, on very large shipments where they've used the wrong code and, you know, you could get whacked for 26% duty rather than say 16 on a woolen sweater. So very, very important. 
Um, know your product codes and the tariffs that apply. Well, yes, that, that's fine. Um, US customs differ slightly from um, our TARIC, which is the European um, tariff codes. You can get those if you want them for um, Irish customs purposes from um, customs in Nina. They will help you with that, but it's not that that information is not necessary on an export order going to the states. Um, the uh, clear in your paperwork, as I was saying, the harmonised code very very important. A really good description of the goods. Let's see if it's ceramics, whether it's glazed or common pottery, all that type of information. Um, some products require additional certification. Yeah, lighting will, um, you'll need a certificate. Sometimes they look for certificates of origin, depending on what country you're going to. The Americans tend to be fairly basic in their documentary requirements once you give them a good description on the invoice. Uh, if you're ever in doubt, you can always give me a call and I'll check it with our guys in New York uh, or Boston or wherever and we'll get you um, a definitive. If you're shipping, some really, really large goods, uh, large orders, I should say. It's probably um, a, a good idea to, um, to get a, what's called a binding ruling. Um, these can be obtained from US Customs for $300. Not really necessary if, the, if it's just a simple thing like a woolen sweater, but if you're getting into other areas um, and technical areas, especially in the IT front, um, it's a good idea to uh, do that. Um, the other one item that I, I would like to mention, um, Mark has kindly showed us there how to build up your landed duty pay price. I'm not a great fan of showing landed duty pay prices on customs invoices. Um, the reason being, sometimes, as I say, the brokers, uh, you wonder, um, they don't see the DDP. Obviously, you have to show your terms of shipment on the invoice. but. In the States, because you're paying duty on a next works price, we always uh, suggest to our clients to show X works on the commercial invoice. That this invoice then can be just issued for customs purposes. Obviously, you send your landed uh, duty pay price to your client. Um, we Just to go back, uh, we, we have a lot of business for QVC here for a couple of uh, fairly large exporters out of Ireland. And um, it's happened to them that uh, the broker didn't see the uh, DDP or the landed duty paid price, and they went ahead and paid duty on top of duty. So that's the last thing you need. So we suggest customs invoices and that they um, show the X works price. Obviously, as I say, your commercial, your in commercial invoice to your client will show the landed duty paid price. Um, Tracking, uh, yeah, everybody wants tracking these days, as you know yourself, if you buy anything on Amazon, you want to see that it's uh, been processed and on the way. So most people now do, nowadays, whether it's an air freight shipment, uh, an ocean freight container shipment, it can be tracked uh, by various, uh, be it the shipping lines websites, the airlines websites, or if it's a FedEx or DHL, it can be tracked on their website as well. So it's a good idea to give your client when they, um, when they uh, order from you and, and you have the order process that you give them the tracking. It's one of my bugbears uh, when I do buy, which I don't buy much online, but when I do is that, you know, they give you these tracking numbers and they're useless because they're probably referred to some postal delivery service or something. So anyway, tracking is a key. It's a huge one. Uh, you can all pack just based on specific side um, weights and options. Yeah, you can do that. Um, but the problem is you never know what type of orders you're going to get. You, you, you know, you're not an IT supplier. You're not a, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not a, a machinery supplier. So by and large, you would probably work with uh, smaller cartons than these guys would be working with uh, when they're building up pallets and that. So. Um, Probably, you know, always best to get a quote. And um, what, what we sort of suggest with people when they're starting out is that they maybe do about three or four different types of packages, maybe put five items in or 10 items, 15 items, 20 items. And that gives you a very good idea of your, of your cost controls and uh, how much it's going to cost um, over um, a range of packages. <coughs> Judy's. Okay, uh, the UK. No idea, I'm afraid. 
Uh, I see Mr. Johnson this morning is saying he has an agreement. Uh, so, but um, it, it's very hard. I, you know, I, I can't even comment on it. I attended so many meetings and sat in at the, so many conferences, and I, I, I'm just dumbfounded as to what's going to happen there. Um, so, I, I think we just have to kick that one down the road for the moment. Um, because if the UK don't know what they're doing, it's very hard for us to do. <laughs> um, Japan. Uh, Japan tends to be a next worst country, just like China, um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They tend to like to buy. Um, the Japanese, for example, use their own forwarders and they're very loyal to, to their own um, people. And they tend to nominate a Japanese freight forwarder who looks after it all. You don't have to get involved. You just hand over the paperwork to the correct pricing. Uh, China, X-Works. Uh, Chinese partners, it's always good to have down there. Uh, they're usually licensed and, um, you know, some of them are pretty bad and some of them are very good. As We, we, we brought a whole um, charter on PPF from China. We've done a couple of them, but one was absolutely rubbish what came in. And uh, so that's why you, you need a good partner in China. Australia, X works again. Uh, it's most common. I, I can't recall anybody doing anybody doing a land of duty paid or DDP in Australia. Um, Canada, there it, they have the CETA agreement now. That's the it should be CETA anyway, but the, it's the common European trade agreement with Canada. Um, once you produce the CETA form, uh, Canadian customs will not take any duty on you go, EU goods. Sorry. <clears throat> And um, basically, um, you just pay the GST, but in most cases, the importer would pay his own GST. It's basically their version of VAT, and they get it back. Um, some of the bigger guys, like I mentioned this morning, uh, Amazon Canada will expect you to uh, deliver duty paid. It's slightly more complicated in, in Canada than the States, uh, but I, if you ever need a hand with it, I can guide you down the road. It's not, it's not rocket. Great. That's about it. That's fantastic. So, John and Marcus, thanks a million for that. Um, I suppose there's a couple of different questions that have come in now, and we might just kind of go through them as they've come up. Um, sure. And some of them you've already kind of touched on. Um, this is probably one for you, John. Are all products charged at the same duty? No. Totally. If uh, anybody has the time, if they just go into that uh, website that you kindly put up there, Nicola, uh, if you just want to see, just put ceramics in, you know, ceramic items, and you, you will see uh, the duty rate, as Marcus has said, will be around 6%. Whereas if you go to, say, a woolen sweater, uh, well-worn uh, example, you'll be looking at 16%. And it varies all over the place. Base and the cotton, um, do you do any cotton, Marcus? Uh, I, 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 I did in the past, but you're bang on. It's seriously yeah, yeah. expensive. I mean, yeah. just any industry that is profitable in the US, they tend to put the duty way up, and there's a lot of cotton in the South. <laughs> so That's it, yeah. That's what they're protecting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so raw as that, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the Americans like a bit of Northern European ceramics and glass. We're quite good at making them, particularly at the French, the English, ourselves. So they like, yeah. a bit of, uh, they like a bit of tabletop from these parts. So the duty isn't so bad. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's the, the sweater one. It's still, it, it can add up quickly as well. You have to be, uh, you can push the price up. Um, so it, it's really important to get that right at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I say, um, they're, they're uh, protectionist and it's probably only going to get worse. Um, like, I don't know what will happen in the Trump situation, but uh, if he stays on, I guess, um, we're probably going to see a lot more protectionism uh, coming around, but uh, hopefully that won't happen. <laughs> no, <it'll be>. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think this is a related question that's just popped in here. How about wooden pieces? I know, John, in the past, we've had inquiries from makers who've had concerns about yep. do they need to treat the wood? Is there spe specifics around wood getting it into the States? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the wood thing is sort of interesting. About uh, 20 years ago, the Canadians found a load of pallets coming into their country uh, from China with all sorts of bugs, uh, you know, yeah. coming in. Yeah. Like, like the, the one they've recently given us as well. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so the Canadians, obviously, because they have huge forestry to protect, uh, they, they got very worried about it. So they imposed a thing called the ISPM 15 um, agreement. Uh, well, it, it was the Australians and themselves and the New Zealanders at the start, but it's spread worldwide now. So this is to protect uh, the environment against bugs coming in from foreign countries because the timber is heat treated and nothing lives in it once it's heat treated. So a bit like furniture, it's a somewhat similar situation. but. If furniture is finished and varnished, there's no problem um, importing timber into the United States. It's fine. So, as I say, it's just once it's not raw that it's uh, finished, like varnish or whatever. I'm not a, a carpenter, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of is related to the next qu question. Are there any products or other products that would have restrictions around them? Right, okay, food stuff is probably one of the ones you really need to watch. Uh, as you know, the Americans have a, an agency called Food and Drug, FDA, and uh, they're very, very particular. Like um, some of our exporters now, that actually last week we were exporting some chocolate bars, and um, obviously you have to be read, you have to have the product registered with the FDA. Uh, you would also need to uh, you have to file what's called prior notification to with the broker to let them know, but your, your freight forwarder will do this on your behalf. Um, it's just something to watch out for. But um, by and large, uh, the Americans are fairly okay with most items coming out of Ireland. Um, the IT thing, okay, is a bit funny, but um, otherwise, you know, food, the normal craft goods coming out of Ireland, it shouldn't be a problem. And how about candles? Yeah. Heard in the past issues around and candles and all of that. Is that still it? Oh, no, they're um, fairly okay at the moment. I think a lot of the candles are being made from soy, so I, I think that's sort of got around the the wax issue. Um, as far as I know now, I haven't been doing a lot of candles, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd have to ask my other half about candles. <laughs> <laughs> So we have another one in here. Are works of art such as sculpture ever duty free in the US or Canada? They're duty free into most countries with a declaration, uh, an original declaration that it's uh, uh, an original work of art. And once that's signed and um, stamped and on headed paper, there will be no duty applicable. But as I say, once again, in Canada, you'd have your GST, but normally the importer picks that up. You know, so. Uh, I think it's about 16% in Canada at the moment. So it should be okay. And then uh, I have one here. Is it always necessary to employ a customs broker? By and large. Um, the Americans have um, um, a sort of a strange uh, little piece of legislation. They allow up to $800 um, into the country without any formal declaration. Um, a lot of the tourist shops use that, um, getting goods in, you know, that they, they push it if you go into, um, you know, buy something in, um, I don't know, wherever in Dublin, and you just go in and you buy, and the people will tell you, oh, it's duty free up to $800. That's totally correct. And there's no broker required on that. There, um, there is another thing up to about $2,200, I think it is at the moment. Um, which is basically an informal entry, uh, which can be done by, um, you know, an importer themselves, but it's not terribly well used, to be honest. Most people like to get, get a broker to do it. It saves all the hassle. Plus, most of it's online, electronic now, uh, like ourselves here in Ireland, you know. Um, if you would decide that, Nicola, you wanted to import something, well, basically you don't have the software to do it, you know, or the the customs and you don't have the customs accounts and things like that. So by and large, your customs broker will be required for basically over eight hundred dollars would be a good rule of thumb. You know. I would, I would suggest definitely at the beginning, guys, a customs broker in the initial stages is absolutely vital until you, until at least you get used to it, and particularly if there are shipments getting larger, you need 
uh, the experience of the paperwork. Um, uh, just, I just something crossed my mind there is, by the way, if you have a, a product that involves, I don't know, wood and glass or metal and glass, which you can do certainly with crystal or, or anything, or even if you've got textiles with, you know, partly cashmere, partly mohair, partly lamb's wool, all those specs still need to be listed in, 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 your, in your commercial invoice. You know, it, to, 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 to a breakdown. And they will, on occasion, John, I, I presume you've seen this, is they, they will, the, the, the inquisitive customs officer, who you do occasionally get, will certainly reconcile the label with what's on the sheet. Now, it doesn't always happen, but if they come across it and they see that it doesn't reconcile, it can be, um, be quite a hassle and, and very important to make sure you keep an eye on the flow of an order, which I know Emerald does, is because if, 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 it, if it gets stuck in customs and you don't react within a certain time frame, they'll send it home. And that, yeah. that, that makes everybody very hungry, homesick and sad. Uh, that's, that's, it's no fun. So just, just a very important, I know you guys do it at Emeralds, but if you're sending it, uh, a product to the US, irrespective you know, of the size of it, it's, it's really important to keep an eye that it's moving all the time. Sure. There are quite a and lot of delays at the moment, John, at the moment with COVID and everything else, isn't there? Huge delays at the moment. Uh, we're, we're seeing, you know, even like with FedEx, it's, it's about 10 days at the moment as opposed mm -hmm. to the usual two or three days, you know. The problem being, of course, is that because of the passenger services have stopped, um, we have very, very little lift out of Ireland at the moment. United Airways are coming in with about four flights a week, but these are um, passenger aircraft and they're just basically filling the bellies of the aircraft with freight. So there's not enough lift around at the moment and of course it's been reflected in the freight costs. Not the ideal time to be starting to export to the States, I'm afraid. I've uh, seen you know, rates which would normally be in the region of about 90 cent a kilo, up around 450 at the moment, you know, so wow. huge increases. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got quoted 16.50 the other day for a shipment to Santiago de Chile, and it was over 2,000 kilos, which is quite a sizable shipment. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so it's not the best time in the world to be starting out uh, exporting. But you know, um, I would think once they get um, you know bodies back on the seats again, um, you know, on the aircraft, we will see a huge reduction. It's just that they're basically paying for you know, 16 tonne of freight in the, um, the aircraft and, um, you know, with no passengers and that's forcing their costs up, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, the, I think that's the challenge for makers at the moment, Marcus. This is something we've had a discussion about, you know, do you just stop exporting during COVID or do you try and keep going or do you use it as a planning period? You know, what's, what's your views on that one, Marcus? I, I think I think planning is a really good idea and doing the research that you may have always wanted to do, but you're kind of busy with your domestic business and you, you don't have time. And, uh, uh, but I think with with recent um, activities, you know, obviously with COVID, it's, it, we can certainly we have that time. So I suppose a do the research, but but b you know, it's actually a really good time to reach out to buyers. And you know, traditionally I would have sent the email and we did a webinar about this and, and then you would you you get a reply back and then you might arrange an appointment to go and see them and obviously travel to the states but a lot of them are taking zoom meetings um uh now i've got i've got a pool of cu of current customers that some of you may have so you've got a you know you, you know who you're reaching out to but th that doesn't necessarily say that you shouldn't reach out to them and, and push at the bottom you know rather than saying I'm traveling to the States in three weeks time. I'd love to come and see you. Say, look, um, uh, I have a, a Zoom account. I'd love to present to you for five or 10 minutes, just like you would do at a trade show. These guys, the, the, the joy of all of this, uh, you know, and I know there hasn't been a lot of joy out of it, is buyers still need to buy. They still need to get product in for Christmas um, and final quarter. So they will they'll take a zoom meeting instead of walking the aisles of the javits center or the atlantic gift show um the other area i would and i've made quite good headway on this in the past couple of months is 
if you're saving yourself uh, uh, the, the airfare to the US and the car rental and the hotels um, for a week on the road, um, instead, send them a sample pack. Send them, you know, if the sample pack costs you, I don't know, 100, 150 in shipping and 70 or 80 bucks in, in samples, um, send that. It's, 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 it's a lot less expensive than taking a flight to the States and driving around in a car for a week, trust me. So there are certain avenues, uh, you know, that, that you can follow. And, and I've, I've got some traction on that. And to be honest, the lead buyers, the, the multiple buyers that we've spoken about on previous some seminars, and I mentioned earlier, they're not going to give you an appointment for three, four months until you fall into their slipstream. So it's a good idea to get things in front of them as well. Um, uh, that, that takes a long period of time, as I mentioned, six months, a year to 18 months to get into these big stores, just like it would if you were getting into Brown Thomas or Selfridges or, or, or the likes in, um, in Europe. So there's, there's absolutely there's opportunity there. And again, you know, the appetite in the American consumer, and it's, this is something we've spoken about, Nicola, is they still have the appetite to buy. And I think their, their COVID um, lifting restrictions <laughs> have shown that they're bursting to get back to business because that's what they do best. So very important to be at the forefront of their minds during that process. Um, uh, I, I think there's, there's really good opportunities. I totally understand, John, there is freight implications on charges, but I presume as things pan out uh, over time, those charges will come back to the, the original pricing. As to how long that is, uh, good luck with that uh, uh, timeline, but I think there's definite opportunity there. Yeah, I have to say one of the interesting things I think from a craft perspective is that for many small businesses, obviously being out in the States a lot is not feasible, but um, we're starting to see a shift now in even the trade shows considering doing elements of their show online. For example, Shop Object should have been having their show in August in New York. Now they've pushed it back to October. They're now not sure whether it'll happen in October or not. So they've simply launched a virtual version of it that'll take place for four days at the end of August, around the 20th of August. And it's a mix of webinars, of one-to-one -one meetings that are set up by appointment in advance, um, and then all sorts of other kind of activities to help people engage on a better level. So I do think as a result of COVID, there's potential for smaller businesses to find other ways to do business that don't mean that you necessarily have to be on the ground in the territory that you want to go to. It doesn't mean that you'll never have to be there, but it might mean that you can have more of a hybrid balance of not being in that territory as much as you might have had to have been previously or previous to COVID. Just popping back to a question there, just um, John, relative to what you said earlier there, we have a question in from Pauline and she's just saying, uh, when John said items up to $800 can be sent to the US with a formal declaration, is that the retail price or the wholesale price? Um, it's a bit of a grey area, so, you know, <laughs> some of the uh, prices I've seen that have been under $800, but, uh, you know, basically, uh, I, I would use the retail on that, you know, so it wouldn't be some of $800. Okay, okay, so retail. Could, could, I, could I just mention one thing, um, Nicola, and I, I meant to cover this, it's the labelling requirements in the United States, it's so important, uh, I think, uh, Marcus will um, yeah, confirm this. Um, you really must show, um, you know, where the goods are manufactured. Um, like bland things like EU, it, it won't go down with um, the US Customs <laughs> Officer. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, you really want to be very careful on that. And um, also the care labels are still very, very important in the States. If it's a garment, you know, how it should be washed and all the rest. And um, so they're just two very important things uh, to remember when you're uh, exporting a garment or you know, yeah. using clothing or whatever. I'm sure Marcus knows all about yeah, that. Con con country of origin is, is yeah, vital. Origin. Yeah. They're so strict about it. Uh, um, they really are. Um, they might let you off once, but that's it. Uh, 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 and, and, and that's only after having provided them with 
some concrete data in the original shipment, but um, country of origin is 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 a definite. Okay. Great. I saw I saw um, nearly twelve thousand garments last year being sent back from um, a company to our warehouse in uh, New York for relabeling. So you can only imagine what the cost on that was. So. Okay. Isn't very thinking about, does it? <laughs> so, so John, do you you have a, a a local warehouse in the states? Yeah. So everything goes into that. Could could you give a quick just uh, the, the 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 pathway? So so it actually does everything land in there to begin with, or? Well, you know, we we've all sorts of different types of clients. So obviously, everybody has their own way of doing things. Um, like. For example, the QVC business would go in by air freight or uh, container, depending on the time of the year. Uh, we would land that at a port. Um, they have a few distribution centers, some of them now out on the West Coast. So we'd say West Coast, we'd land it in um, you know, Long Beach, which is just beside there, Los Angeles there. We'd clear it and locally deliver. Um, the, other, it really depends. Everybody has their own way of doing things. Um, we wouldn't take everything into our warehouse, uh, our LCL, which is less than cargo loads, proper, usually known as groupage cargo. Uh, we take that all right into our warehouse in Union, New Jersey. It's a bonded facility. Um, the guys, it's so big, the guys go around in a golf cart. That's how big it is, because <laughs> it's too far to walk around. So, um, Basically, um, we would use that for the breaking down of our groupage containers, LCL containers. We would clear the goods through customs, and then we'd just deliver uh, locally um, to Montana or California or wherever it's going. And uh, basically, that's what we do. But um, on the smaller packages side, I guess we're probably using FedEx or whoever, you know, to most expedient way of getting it there. Um, on the general air freight side, we just usually land that in the nearest uh, city to where um, the goods are going to be delivered. Just say, for example, it's um, Clarksville, we'd probably, you know, um, Arkansas, we'd probably just put that into a local airport, maybe sometimes Houston. It would all be depending on the rates that are available at the time. Um, right. during, during the summer months, obviously, the rates are less because normally, Delta here, American Airways, you know, of course Aer Lingus, and we have um, United as well. But unfortunately this year, um, we don't have those options, so the rates are high. Uh, coming into the Christmas period, rates tend to move up a notch because obviously um, we're kicking, uh, the airlines are kicking back on their services. They're going in what's called a shoulder months because there's not that many people traveling, so rates tend to be a bit higher. So we would look at various options. Um, so just, just say, for example, we'd probably use Chicago quite a bit because it's still a pretty good service during the winter there. And, you know, we're in central USA, basically, and we can uh, truck it around wherever we want to move it, you know? All right. Good. Well, Marcus, this is one for you. What is the average markup in the US, or is there such thing as a typical or average markup? It's a really good question. Um, you know, it used to be Keystone, um, uh, so it was just, you know, two, but now that um, domestic US shipping costs like ground services have gone up um, in the last decade, it's kind of veered up to 2.2, 2.4. I would suggest if you're pioneering a range, um, you, you, you try and go at 2.4 because that's a good appetite for the customer. The retailer, you know, they've got a lot of inherent costs these days. Uh, uh, commercial real estate rates in the U.S. have had a, a strong climb in the last 20 years. So, so rents are tough. Um, so kind of, I think 2.4. Um, if you've got a very successful product, you can get away with less. The big guys, they, they want, they want, they want 2.4 to even 2.6. And if you're in fashion, it can go up as, as high as 2.8 because the fashion guys are, are, you know, it's very seasonal. They bring in, you know, heavy classic clothing or heavy woolen clothing for winter. They have a completely different shelf 
in, in, in the, for the summer because of the seasons in the US. Uh, uh, so they need to shift that product in the sale period, but they still want to make their margin. So it depends on the type of product. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I represent um, one of my agencies is Avoca Handweavers, and the majority of our product is, is 2.2 for uh, uh, the retailer, and they're happy with that. Um, uh. Excellent. And I suppose one of the things we've talked a little bit about, Marcus, I think Marcus might, um, I suppose this is one that I've talked about with so many makers as well, is that by the time you factor in your margins, your freight, your duties and all the rest, you, you, you're looking at your RRP and you're thinking, okay, that's bringing me substantially above what I need to charge here in Ireland. And you touched on this in the presentation, you're saying, you know, you have to deal with those discrepancies. Um, what, do you, what is the best thing to do? Is it to have a range that you only sell abroad or is it a case that you bring up your pricing here in Ireland to match it or is there a, is there a best case to, or a best way to handle that? It's a, good, it's a good question and it's quite a complicated one insofar as it, it varies for everybody depending on the product. But um, I, no, I would certainly still sell all your product abroad. Um, there are various, there are ways around it. Um, I suppose, you know, our VAT rate in Ireland is quite high, uh, which essentially is sales tax in the US. Um, uh, so because it's 23% um, uh, for the majority of products, you, there's a bit of a buffer there. So let's say that 10 euro um, uh, wholesale, that will probably retail in Ireland for kind of 22, 24 euro. Um, it, it, once you've done the maths that I showed on the spreadsheet, if you've got your $13.50 uh, uh, for the retailer, you can sell that at $29.50. So therefore, you know, $29.50 versus an, a euro pricing of, of $22.24, that, that's fine. They're, they're happy. That's a level playing field. There's a little bit of currency in there that people understand they have to pay for. Um, uh, the other thing is if you're shipping you know, individual products to the US, there is going to be quite a high shipping charge. So that also writes off a, a little bit of the cost for the US consumer um, when they're buying it in store because obviously the shipping has already been paid because they're buying it at the point of purchase. So um, no, I think you should sell all your ranges, but you just need to, you need to be careful on that. Uh, uh, to, to make sure that they do reconcile. Um, uh, and again, I can help anybody with those price lists. I know, um, Nicola, we've worked with various different makers um, and, and it seems daunting at the beginning, but it, it, no, it works out, it works out very well. Um, uh, I, I think it, it, pushing your price up a little bit, but that's, that's okay. I don't think you need to change your Euro pricing for that. Good, good. I think what we keep coming back to on every topic today is it's really down to the homework, isn't it? It's really about making sure that you're actually looking at the reality of what your costs are and that you've done your homework and figured out that you have everything covered. That The, the last thing you want to do with any market, be it the US or anywhere else, is that you're entering into it and actually not making enough money on that to make it worth your while. So it is down to that preparation in advance. We've one last question in here, and then I think we may wrap it up. But uh, how is business in the US at the moment? Marcus, how are you finding it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. I, mean, I know we touched on it this morning. Uh, uh, John asked me. Um, wary, um, but, but wanting to buy is, would be the way I'd put it. Um, you know, January, February, March, I kind of run around the US trying to to, to sell to some of the multiples. Um, uh, obviously you'll pick up any of the independent business that you can for their spring or, or fall. And, and again, I'm selling a lot of textiles, so it tends to be fall in the US. Um, the bigger guys have all ordered. They're not as, the orders aren't as, as uh, to the same degree as last year and the year before, but they have ordered. Um, they've put subject to, to, to COVID restrictions uh, uh, so basically it means they're giving the responsibility of the manufacturing back to uh, the inventory cost back to us. But having said that, um, independence, I'm, I'm liaising with independence, they're, they're eager to know that you've, you've got stock, you're able to ship it, 
and, and you're able to do business with them. Um, they want reassurance for that. So uh, uh, there are some online stores that are doing really well. I've got a very strong store in New York. They've got um, a, a great site, a um, company called Gracious Home, and they're flying because they've got a very good online business. Um, uh, so uh, look, it's, it's not where it was this time last year. Um, obviously, I, you know, I'm a traveling salesman. Half of that statement is, is not existent at the moment. I can't travel. So, so you know, you, you, they're, 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 they're being very cautious, but they want to get moving is, is how I would put it. And, and in, in, in order to be able to be ready for that, I would be reassuring them constantly with lines of communication about that you've got stock, you've got a good price list, and you can get the product over to them quickly when they need it. Um, that, that, that would be uh, 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 my, my advice. Great. Well, listen, on that note, I think we'll wrap it up for today. I just want to say a huge thank you to John and to Marcus. Um, I think it was great to get that kind of sense of insider knowledge because I know for me anyway, everything to do with customs is like the dark art. I, I freeze when I think about it. So it's <laughs> yeah. great that somebody talk us through it and kind of understand it is, you know, it is practical, it's doable, but you do need to be aware of what's needed and what's necessary and have all that in hand. I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar. I hope you found it useful. We will have the presentation available and Marcus's spreadsheet, a few people have asked for that. And I think he may have mentioned a cheat sheet, so we'll try and get that out of him as well. So listen, thanks very much. And um, if you do have any further questions, feel free to email either myself or Emer. Um, at the DCCI, you'll find our, our uh, information is all up on the website. But thanks again until the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.